morning. Welcome to Broadway. We're so glad that you are here, that you're here to worship with us. My name is Mike Stallins. I'm one of the elders, and uh, we're here to prepare our hearts for worship this morning. I'd like to read a passage from 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. If you've got your Bibles, feel free to join along with me. But there were also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who, brought, who bought them. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. Many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. In their greed, they will make up clever lies to get a hold of your money. But God condemned them long ago and their destruction will not be delayed. For God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell into gloomy pits of darkness where they are being held until the day of judgment. And God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah and the seven others in his family. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. Later, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and turned them into heaps of ashes. He made them an example of what will happen to ungodly people. But God also rescued Lot out of Sodom because he was a righteous man who was sick of the shameful immorality of the wicked people around him. Yes, Lot was a righteous man who was tormented in his soul by the wickedness he saw and heard day after day. So you see, the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials, even while keeping the wicked under punishment until the day of final judgment. He is especially hard on those who follow their own twisted sexual desire and who despise authority. These people are proud and arrogant, daring even to scoff at supernatural beings without so much as trembling. But the angels, who are far greater in power and strength, do not dare to bring from the Lord a charge of blasphemy against those supernatural beings. Let us pray. Almighty God, we, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here and to worship. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his death, burial, and resurrection. Lord, we ask that while we are here, you pour out your spirit upon us. As we worship you, just teach us and show us the truth that you want us to understand through Ian's message today. Pierce our hearts and lead us so that we may surrender and give ourselves to you. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Hey, good morning. Why don't you go ahead and stand with us? Let's start our time of worship here this morning. We've been given the greatest news that we could possibly be given, that Jesus is alive and that he wants to spend eternity with us. So let's give him praise today. Gathered under one name, 
Broadway Christian Church. If your child has been registered for the large group time, now is a great time to escort them so that they may take part in that. I forgot to do that in first service, and I'm feeling like kind of remorseful about it, but not really, not that badly, because they, they lined up. It's like I didn't have to say anything. They knew exactly what to do. But anyway, now is the time for that to happen. Again, thank you for being here with us today. At some point this morning, you or a member of your household should receive a text that has a link to our uh, digital connect card. So if you would, follow that link, and you can fill that out, and that's a great way for us to know how we can be praying for you, and we can connect with you. That's why that clever name exists. It's the connect card. Also, make sure that you're paying attention to your email this week because we always send out our weekly e-news. That's a great way for you to know about things that are going on in the life of the church. Speaking of that, on Wednesday night, we do this every Wednesday night through the end of the year, Ian will be leading us in a Bible study through the Gospel of John. Even if you have not attended that up to this point, you can still jump in and be a part of that. You don't want to miss out on that. And if you can't be here For any reason, we do put that up on our website at broadwaycc.org like the next day, somewhere around there. And so, again, thank you for being here with us today. And on our live stream, I'm going to say a word of prayer, then Ian will come and share a message with us today. God, this morning you have already blessed us as we are here to bless you. We thank you for this gathering of people that you have brought together And right now, we continue to give you worship. We continue to praise you uh, through listening to what you have to say to us. So make us attentive. Open our ears and our hearts to what you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, everybody. Look at all those good-looking, smiling faces <laughs> that no one can see. Welcome, everyone, to the live stream as well. Thanks for joining us. Grab a Bible, open it up to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7. Uh, the picture on your screen is a puffer fish. Cute little thing, isn't it? It's a tiny little fish. Those are the ones you know that kind of blow up like a balloon. It is the second most poisonous vertebrate on the planet. The next picture is called a slow loris. Isn't that one cute? Looks like a baby Ewok. Uh, Nice, cute, little, little sweet thing. Those big old eyes, you just fall in love with it. Uh, That animal emits poison out of its elbows that kills its unsuspecting victims quite quickly. The last one is called a blue-ringed octopus. Again, very cute. It's only about the size of a quarter tiny little thing. Uh, You can hardly even see it when it's sitting somewhere. That, about the size of a quarter, carries enough venom in it to kill 26 adults. And currently, there is no anti-venom for it. So if you get stung by it, it has been nice knowing you. You know, there there are things in our animal world that are so cute, or they're so small, We have no idea how dangerous they really are. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus gives to us this command. And it's so small. It's just a verse. It's it's such a cute little command that we have honestly no idea how hard it really is, how challenging it really is. Chapter 7, verse 12. Do to others what you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. Now, we we know this as the golden rule. Do to others what you would have them do to you. A a statement that is so widely known, that's so pervasive in our culture, uh, most people who know it don't even know that it comes from the Bible because you'll find it everywhere. You'll find it in non-Christian environments. You'll find it everywhere outside of the church. it's, It's just everywhere because it's this nice, ethical, cute little statement that has become so overused. It has become so bland because of that. You know, last week, one of the things that I said at the beginning is as we get into chapter 7, Jesus is going to get in our face 
with some things, with some of his teaching. And, and as the chapter progresses, he kind of ratchets that up and gets really confrontational. It will really come to a crescendo next week. But he's doing all that. And then you look at a verse like this in verse 12. How in the world is that in your face? It's such a harmless little command. Do to others what you would have them do to you. I think this might be the most confrontational statement that Jesus would make in the sermon. You know, over the course of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Jesus makes a series of what I would call summary statements. He'll make this statement that, that will summarize everything that he's just taught before that. He's kind of been building up to it, and then he'll kind of lay out this great statement that summarizes the last chapter or several paragraphs. Sometimes Jesus will come to one of these summary statements that summarize entire belief systems of Christianity and, and how Christians are to behave. He, he's summing up entire thoughts. Uh, chapter 5, verse 20 is one of these. He says, But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, he's been building up to that one in chapter 5 with all those statements of, you've heard that it was said, but I tell you. You've heard that it was said, but I tell you. And he, he kind of brings up the level of requirement for believers. That's a challenging thing. And he, he summarizes it with that incredible statement. Unless it surpasses that of the religious leaders and the Pharisees, here's the thing. That was impossible. You're, you're not going to get more righteous than the Pharisees were. Not righteous in the cool surfer sense of the word, but righteous as in living rightly the way God has commanded to live. You're not going to obey the Old Testament law better than the Pharisees did. They were virtually flawless in their obedience to the letter of the law. Uh, chapter 5, verse 48. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. What, what a statement. You know, I, I don't find that there are a lot of people who take Matthew 5, 48 and put it into Christian art. Nobody has that one like etched on a wall or in a, a, a poster of some kind because we don't like that verse. You have to be perfect as God is perfect. That is his expectation of you. Chapter 6, verse 33. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. He'll give you everything that you need. Again, a whole chapter of teaching summed up in one statement. Chapter 7, verse 12, this golden rule is one of these summary statements. He's not summing up what he's taught before. He's summing up the entirety of how Christians are to function in their relationships. Remember, this is God's kingdom manifesto. It's what we're calling the Sermon on the Mount. This is how citizens in my kingdom live. This is who citizens in my kingdom are. And he's summing up for us, this is what it means to live relationally in God's kingdom. This is who we are, and this is what we do. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. You know, there are a number of ways that you can treat the people around you. And I want to spend the next few minutes, let's just unpack that. Here's his teaching. You, you are to treat them like you want to be treated. Well, there are a number of ways to do that. Here's the first. You can treat others like you want to treat them. It's a pretty simple way to treat people. Just however you want to. So if you're in a good mood, you had a good cup of coffee this morning, had that caffeine hit, uh, some, you know, things are going well for you at your job, everything's kind of perfect in your life, Every, everything's balanced just how you want it to be, you're going to be really nice. People are going to get along well with you. But boy, if you're having a bad day, if, uh, if you haven't had your cup of coffee or Diet Coke for the day, uh, if you got caught in a little bit of traffic, if you woke up on the wrong side of the bed, which I don't even know how you do that, because if I wake up on the other side of the bed, Jody gets hurt. So I don't even know how you get to the other side of the bed, but if you, if you did all of that, then look out. Everybody around you is toast. And we know people like this, don't we? Maybe you live with someone like this. Don't let them know that, because if you do, it will go poorly for you the rest of the day. Maybe you are one of these people. We, these are the people that we have to dance around when we first see them for a day because we don't quite know how it's going to go. We don't know if they're in a good mood or a bad mood. How, how are they going to treat us? So we kind of stay back and we, we observe how they are treating other people. And if they're treating them well, then we kind of go and, and now we can interact with this person, but we're watching and you, are they barking at everybody? What's happening? And, and so we're walking on eggshells trying to figure out, can I engage with this person? Can I not engage 
with that person. We know people like this. These are people who treat others based on the roller coaster of their emotions. However they happen to be feeling at, at the moment, that's how you're going to get treated. We are not supposed to treat people based on that roller coaster of how it is that I happen to be feeling right now. There's a second way you can treat people. You can treat others like they deserve to be treated. This is the one we like. Treat them like the, the way they deserve it. You know, the first one of treat people like you want to, that's a major driving force, I think, for a whole lot of people. This one is also a major driving force. Treat them like you like they deserve to be treated. But it just so happens that twice in the verses right before verse 12, Jesus has taught us to not do that. The, the first six verses we looked at last week, of don't judge, don't condemn, don't label. Don't label people as pigs and dogs and, and all of that. You, like, we're not in the judgmental business. That's not our place. We don't sit in that chair where we get to condemn other people. So don't treat people that way. And it just so happens in the verse right before this, in chapter 7, verse 11, Jesus is teaching on a prayer, and he says, your heavenly Father gives good gifts to those who ask him. He didn't say God gives good gifts to those who deserve it. But to those who ask, whether or not they deserve it is inconsequential. They've asked their gracious and generous heavenly Father, and he meets those needs. So right after that, literally the next sentence is now Jesus saying, you know how God treats people? Not based on how they deserve, are deserve to be treated. Neither are you to treat people how they deserve to be treated. Because friends, our God has shown us mercy. Our God has shown us grace. He's, he's offered forgiveness to us. Can there be anybody who would ever dare claim that they deserved that treatment from God? Of course not. He, he gives good things to those who ask, regardless of whether they deserve it or not. Now we are to do the same in the very next verse. This is where I think the golden rule starts to tarnish a bit for us. If we like the idea of do to others, you'd have them do to you. But we like treating people like they deserve to be treated because it feels right. It feels just. We are administering justice on God's behalf. Not that we would ever say that because it's not based on anything about God's standards. It's based on our own. We love treating people like they deserve to be treated because if I don't, if I don't punish them in this way, if they don't understand what they've done, they're going to get away with it. It feels like I'm letting them off the hook. So if a friend fails you at a key time, you harbor bitterness because it makes you feel better to think bad things about them. A coworker drops the ball on a major project and it, it, it came back and, and bit you because of that. So you gather some of your other coworkers around and you gossip about them mercilessly because everybody needs to know what they did and how they failed and that it wasn't my fault. Your spouse says something you don't like, so you give them the cold shoulder for a few days. You'll show them. Here's the problem with living that way, of, of treating people like they deserve to be treated, is that makes you the judge, the jury, and the executioner. You decide who's right and wrong, and you decide how they get punished. It makes you the most important person in the room. It makes you the one that has to be pleased, and if you aren't pleased, then look out, because you're going to be on a rampage. How dangerous it is to live that way. And as much as we like to sit in that chair to judge and condemn and to execute their punishment, as much as we like to do that, friends, that chair was never meant for us to sit in. Romans chapter 14, verse 4. Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall, and with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. We don't sit in that chair. Philippians Chapter 2, verse 3. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Now, this isn't saying that, here's what you need to know. There are people around you who are better than you. And there are people around you, by default then, who are worse than you. And your job is to let them know who they are. So if they're better than you, you treat them like they're better. If they're worse than you, they need to know that because they need to step up their game. So you let them know that you're better than they are. 
treat people like they deserve. That's not what Philippians is telling us. It's to treat people, all people, as if they were better than you, as if they had more value than you, as if they outranked you. You treat them as such, no matter who they are, no matter how they are, you view them as better, whether you want to or not, whether they deserve it or not. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 says, And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, we've, th- this is also one of those summary statements in the Bible that, that sums up what's before and what's coming afterwards in that famous marriage section of, hey, wives, here's how this looks like for you. Husbands, here's what this looks like for you. But to all, submit to one another. We've talked about this word submit before. It's a military term. It means to voluntarily rank yourself underneath someone else. It's voluntary. It's not forced. It can never be forced. It's you volunteering. I'm going to view them as if they outrank me, as if they're a commanding officer. I'll treat them with that respect. I'll treat them with that mindset as if they outrank me. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's the most important statement in that verse. You are to do this relationally out of your respect for Christ, not based on your respect for this other person, their role is really inconsequential. This is based on your relationship with the Lord and how you feel about what he's done for you. Now you are to treat people then based on what he's done for you out of reverence for Christ. I I go over this point at length and ad nauseum with young couples who come to me for premarital counseling. And this is what I tell them. There will be days. There will be a lot of days that you will not want to submit to your spouse. That doesn't matter at all. There will be days. There will be lots of days that you don't think your spouse deserves for you to submit to them. And that doesn't matter at all. This command is to you not based on the behavior of your spouse. It is based on how you view who Jesus is and what he's done on your behalf out of reverence for Christ. This applies to every relationship you and I have. Based on our reverence for him, we now submit to others and treat them as if they are better. So you can treat others like you want to treat them. You can treat others like they deserve to be treated. Third, you can treat others like they've treated you. This is the easy one, right? Just mimic whatever they do. You're on defense. So whatever they initiate, you respond in kind. So if they're rude to you, guess what? That's an open door to be rude back to them. They mouth off to you, mouth off back. If they gossip about you, just gossip about them. And boy, that feels just, doesn't it? It feels fair. feels like there's balance in the universe because you know, you're going to dish it out. Guess what? You're going to get it back. We like this kind of treatment. But we don't supposed to live this way. This is that eye for an eye mentality. You know, Jesus dealt with this in chapter 5. You've heard that it was said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. We like that rule. Again, I'm just going to match you. Whatever you do, I'm going to come right back at you, eye for an eye. But Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. He says, my people, my kingdom people are to live differently. It is to be noticeably so that you don't treat people like other people treat people. So we aren't to live life on the defense where we're just waiting for people to do whatever they're going to do to us and then we respond in kind. No, we're, we're to go on the offense. This, that's how this is supposed to work. We're to be different. Romans chapter uh, 12 Starting in verse 17. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. 
So we don't live on the defense. Y yes, don't let evil conquer you, but what are you supposed to do in response? You conquer evil by doing good. You go on the offense. You know, this golden rule, do to others, you'd have them do to you, is found in virtually every world religion on earth. Because it's an ethical statement that helps summarize how you're supposed to treat people. Every religion on earth does that. Again, it has some component of how you're supposed to treat one another. The Jews of Jesus' day had a statement like this. Again, it, it's across the board, but there was one key difference in all of those statements in the, the Judaism of Jesus' day and all of the world religions today. There's one key difference. All of the other faiths of the world make this statement in the negative. Don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. It's called the, the silver rule, which is why Christians are better, because ours is gold and theirs is just silver. Don't do to them. It's, it's negative. It's defensive. Don't do those things. Jesus flips it to the positive. The only one in human history to do so. You aren't just to sit back and wait. You are to initiate good things in the lives of the people around you, no matter how they treat you, no matter what they've already done, no matter how they're going to respond. You are to do to them first, actively, whatever it is that you want them to do to you. Which leads us to the last way to treat people, which is how Jesus taught us. To treat others like you want to be treated. And this is easy for us to figure out, isn't it? How do you want people to treat you? I mean, if I gave you a piece of paper and a pen and asked you to come up with a list, you would come up pretty quickly with a list. This is how I want to be treated. You want to be respected. You want to be loved. You want to be trusted. You want to be given the benefit of the doubt. You want to be judged based on your intentions, not your actions, because you meant well and you want people to treat you that way. Great. There's nothing wrong with those things, that this is how you want to be treated. So our job then is to take all of that and actively initiate all of those things into the lives of the people around us because I'm going to trust them. I'm going to respect them. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. Why? Because that's what I want from them. And even if I don't get it from them, that's what's coming from me because that's what the Lord has called me to do. So it turns out this idea is a, a key relational theme throughout the entire New Testament. Matthew chapter 22, a religious leader comes to Jesus and asks, what do you think is the greatest commandment? There are 613 in the Old Testament. What's number one? Verse 37 of Matthew 22. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Equal with loving God is love your neighbor. And how are you supposed to do that? You love them as you love yourself. Ephesians chapter 5 Again, you've got that relational statement in verse 21, cemented one another out of reverence for Christ. It goes right into wives, here's how it looks for you. Then husbands, here's how it looks for you. The husbands get an illustration of how they're supposed to do this with their wife. Verse 28. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it just as Christ cares for the church. Do you see the point? You are to love your neighbor like you love you. Husbands, you are to love your wife like you love you. And here's why. You are the expert on how to love you. Nobody loves you like you do. You're the greatest lover of you on the planet. When you have a need, you meet it. Even if it's challenging, you'll move heaven and earth to meet that need. When church is over, you're going to go eat lunch because your body's going to tell you that you're hungry. You have a physical need, and guess what you're going to do? You're going to eat because why in the world would you not meet that need? You've got something you want to do. You might even sit, sit down this afternoon, and your eyes are going to get a little heavy. You know what you're going to do? You're going to take a nap as you should. It's the Lord's day. Take a nap. 
When you get tired tonight, you're going to go to bed because you're going to meet your needs. You will move heaven and earth to meet them because you love you. Take that same level of love that you have for you and actively initiate it into the lives of the people around you. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Move heaven and earth to meet their needs. Do whatever you can, whatever you have to do to do that for them. Love them like you love you. So you can treat others like you want to treat them. You can treat them like they deserve to be treated. You can treat them like uh, they've treated you. Or you can follow this cute, small little command from Matthew 7, 12, where you actively initiate into the lives of the people around you the love that he's called you to love with. And I think we have to admit that Jesus is the epitome of this, and he fleshes this out for us, doesn't he? Of what it looks like to offer love, to initiate that love in the life of someone else, regardless of whether they deserve it or not. Isn't this what he's done for us? You know, if, if I need something that I'm dependent on someone else for, I want them to do whatever they have to do to do it. If I get injured and I'm in the emergency room, I want those doctors and nurses to do everything they could possibly do to save me. I want them to treat me in that moment as if it's them on the gurney. Our Lord has done everything that he could possibly have done to meet your need. Because we found ourselves in a place of tremendous, tremendous need. We were at a place of spiritual death, and we needed new life. Sin had destroyed our relationship with God. It had destroyed our, us and the relationships with the people around us. It's actively harming us. We, we have this need, a need that we cannot fix on our own. We can't just fix a relationship with God on our own. We just can't remove sin on our own. We don't have that power. We needed someone else to do it. And he did everything he could possibly do to get that done by his sinless life, by his substitutionary death, he actively initiated all of that good into our lives. Romans 5, 8, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait until we did something good. He did it first for us to save us. And now we have life. Now we've received the forgiveness of sins because he did exactly what we're talking about. And friends, the, the response is clear. This is what Jesus has done on behalf of everyone. He stepped into that place of death and of punishment, and he took it onto himself, took it away from you, so that by trust in him, you could be saved from your sins, you could be forgiven, you could be granted eternal life from a place of spiritual death. He did all of that. And friends, the response is simple and clear. You need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God who died for your sins and rose from the dead. You need to repent of sin and turn to Jesus. You need to confess Jesus as Lord. You need to unite with Jesus as you're immersed in the waters of baptism. If you haven't done that, friends, those are the clear next steps. When the service is over, I'll be in the lobby. I'd love to have this conversation with you. We can talk about this all day long. I'll answer those questions you may have. But for now, we're going to take a couple of minutes and take communion together. We're going to take this little piece of bread, this little cup of juice, and with them be reminded of this truth that Jesus has done everything he could have possibly done to step in and meet our needs. Let's pray together. Well, Father in heaven, again, we are overwhelmed that you are this way. That you give good gifts, not to those who deserve it, but to those who ask. So for those today who are still in need of salvation, who are in need of the forgiveness of sins, who are in need of life and life eternal, all they have to do is ask, and you will grant. So for those who have not done that, may today be the day that they change the course of their life and their eternal destination. And for the rest of us who've already done that, who already know Jesus, who already love him for who he is and for what he's done, we take this little, pre, little piece of bread and this little cup of juice and with them we remind ourselves of how good you are and how much you love us. That you initiated 
this into our lives in the midst of our sin and rebellion and did not deserve it from you. Thank you for your grace that does such good things. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You go ahead and stand with us. Let's sing together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe.
this morning. Fill us with your love so that we can obey that golden rule that we've heard about this morning. Lord, help us to be more and more like Jesus every day. In his name we pray. Amen. I want to thank you again for being here today. Um, our mission here is that we help people find hope in Christ and a home in his church, and it is not in any small part um, that we can do that because of your generosity. And we thank, you for, we thank you for your faithfulness there. We just want to remind you there are a few ways that you can give. You can either go to broadwaycc.org slash giving, and you can do that there. You can text any amount to 84321. That's a very simple way to do it. And if you prefer to do things the more traditional way, if you're here in this room today, uh, we have offering boxes um, at each exit, and you can give there. We're going to sing one more song before we go today. Thanks again for being here. He is the everlasting God that we serve. Strength arises. Strength arises. We wait upon the 